wait a few seconds. Never know how long to wait. Um, okay, I'm just gonna go ahead and start. Okay, hello everyone and welcome to the Be Me Live. So today we have a very special guest in this podcast. This is Sarah Della Ripa. She's a biomedical engineer. She has a master's in biomedical engineering. Uh, she's currently a lecturer at California's Polytechnic State University. And, but she's also been in industry, which is pretty cool. And yeah, she, a lot of the things that she's done are really focused on maternal slash women's health, which is not really an area of focus that you see a lot of uh, people working on, but it's really awesome that she's bringing awareness to this area. And so we're very happy to have you here, Sarah. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So we'll just start by asking you, um, you know, could you give us a little brief summary of what your education, um, I guess, path has been like for you? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I, I really like the way that my education path went. I started at community college. I graduated high school thinking, how in the world could I be expected to know what I want to do with the rest of my life? So I went to community college and just kind of explored that. Um, I knew I wanted to do something with math. I really liked math. I went through all kinds of different majors before I landed on biomedical engineering. Uh, and then I transferred to Cal Poly, uh, mostly because of how great the engineering program is and especially the biomedical engineering program, but also just proximity to my family. And I was there. Um, for my undergrad, and then I applied to their four plus one program, which is a blended master's program that they offer for biomedical engineering. Mm -hmm. And I got my master's uh, via that avenue. Both my senior project and my master's thesis were in the maternal health field. That's awesome. And it's really interesting to hear you, you know, just say that you didn't really know what to do in the beginning, which I think is true for a lot of people. And yeah, it's it's crazy because I actually, I'm originally from Mexico and over there, like university, like you have to start right away in your career path. So it's really cool that here in the US, you kind of get a little bit of flexibility to just have a little bit more time to really decide. Um, but just going on with that, you know, you mentioned that you liked math. Uh, which I think is something that a lot of us have in common. But, you know, what made you really choose to go for biomedical engineering instead of all the other engineerings? That's a good question. I will jump to the moment where I decided engineering in general is what I wanted to do. I went through some other things. At one point, I think I thought I wanted to be an architect or an astrophysicist, but Anyways, eventually I ended up landing on engineering and then I really had to choose which branch of engineering, like most of us do. Um, and I really just couldn't see myself sitting in a cubicle working nine to five on something that I didn't feel purpose in. So, so I, I do feel like all BMEs kind of share this as well, is that there's just so much purpose in it. Um, specifically in my case, my grandma was quadriplegic and I grew up seeing my dad make little gadgets for her to make her life easier. It was before Siri. So he would make these little buttons for her. She could kind of yeah. lean onto the button to call somebody, um, my grandpa or my mom. So it was uh, a lot of my dad to just kind of pushing me in this direction and He's an automation engineer, so uh, he was he's wow. very much exposed to the biomedical engineering world. So <laughs> that's that's why I chose biomedical engineering uh, and that in community college and what led me to apply to Cal Poly. Yeah, that that's a that's a really good story. Honestly, I think it's one of a kind and it's very interesting. And I mean, it really we can really tell that it. outline your go-to 
biomedical engineering. So, you know, once you decided biomedical engineering is my thing, you start this passion for the maternal slash women's health um, area because it's not very common. And, you know, you mentioned for your senior project and your master thesis, you decided to, to do a project around this area. You know, I also actually did my senior design project around the maternal health uh, technology. So it's pretty cool that we share that and have that in common. But yeah, so what, you know, what made you really choose this and stick with it? Yeah, I, I do think that's really uncommon. So it's, it's great that we share that. Uh, mm -hmm. So when I was in my senior design project at Cal Poly, there were a few different sponsors who would pitch their ideas for the senior design class. And one of those projects happened to be out of luck, really. Um, a project that was sponsored by a startup company called Impress Technologies, now called Olivia Health. So they pitched a project and basically wanted a student team to work with them. They had an office in San Luis Obispo at the time. That's where Cal Poly is located. Uh, and and so I chose the project, they kind of chose me back, and, and that's how it started. So um, through that, I became an intern for the company. I, um, it was a really small team. We all just got along really well. So it kind of worked out really perfectly. And I, I was just answering the second part of your question. I was completely blown away by how big of a gap this maternal health field is and how high the rates are for maternal deaths during childbirth, it, I just, I couldn't believe it. So that's really what got me passionate about the field and wanting to stick with it and knowing that we need engineers, we need everyone in this space really, so. Yeah, no, yeah, that's, that's a great point. And I think it cut out a little bit, but I think the main, uh, the most important thing is really did stick so that's good uh, and that's very interesting because yeah for a senior design project we also had that opportunity to maybe reach out to uh, potential sponsors that we can work with but i don't know we really didn't didn't end up finding anyone but it's really cool that you were able to find that and not only make it your project but also you know intern for them and so is lydia health um I guess like the company that you eventually worked for when you graduated or how was your your life like after graduating from your bachelor's or did you automatically graduate with a master's? Like how did that work? Yeah, so, and let me know if this is cutting out too bad. I can try to switch rooms here, but I hope that you can hear me okay. Um, so Olivia Health, they, yeah, you, am I good? Olivia Health was a company, a uh, startup company that came out of Cal Poly, the concept at least came out of Cal Poly, and um, they have a device that is meant to treat postpartum hemorrhage, that's excessive bleeding after childbirth, it's the leading direct cause of maternal death across the globe, so it's a major topic, and um, when I got on board with them, they uh, working with them on my senior design project and then eventually interning with them. Uh, it was really working with them that motivated me to apply for my master's. I probably wouldn't have gotten my master's, um, at least not in that moment, if it wasn't for the work experience with them. I was pretty done with school. Like I was in school for a long time and it was exhausting, but finding a, a sponsor <laughs> and a project that I really cared about was so crucial to getting through my master's degree and and didn't feel like school i just i loved it and it was a really great project for me yeah no that that's something that you know they were able to sponsor you and you know push you to that direction and really encourage you to get your master's in you know something that my dad actually told me once is that you know, when I was trying to think of what major to do in college, he said, like, just do something, you'll be good at it, you know, you'll be passionate about it. And I think, you know, it's definitely true, like that, once you start going into the industry, 
you kind of start feeling like you get up so discomfortable, but you actually start mirroring their passions and their like research and things like that. So cool that you know you got to be in this field, and then I don't know, it's just it's just really awesome. Um, so you know those are really cool things and great industry experience. Uh, were you, I think I saw on your LinkedIn that your official was like engineering consultant, which you want to talk a little bit more about like what you kind of did for Olivia Health and, you know, your overall duties as an engineer there. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I really love being a contractor or a consulting engineer. Um, it's given me a lot of different kinds of experiences. Um, there's a whole nother part of that that I won't get into on this podcast, but as far as balancing life while being a consultant and, and, and all of the, the things that come with that, but I really love that I've been able to set this up for myself and my career. So being a contractor for me has meant that I don't, my work is not consistent. Uh, it's kind of all over the map. Sometimes I've been able to travel for the company and that takes up, you know, a ton of time. And then um, other times it'll be some research or phone calls and meetings every so often, every couple of weeks. So it's just kind of all over the map with the consulting or contracting. So when I was working with Lydia as an engineer, a lot of my job was to... Um, use solid modeling software and uh, get things prototyped, 3D printed. I'd often outsource that and, and have someone else take my STL files and, and make prototypes that we can bench top test them. So that was a lot of my role, um, even from the early parts of my working with them. Um, uh, and then I was, you know, a little bit more involved with the testing, which was really fun and getting to travel. Um, mm -hmm. So that kind of encompasses, I think, a lot of what I was doing with Olivia. Yeah, no, that's that's a great explanation. And it sounds definitely sounds really fun and a great, you know, experience to have as a recent graduate and early professional. So, and, you know, you had this experience in industry. At what point did you decide because of for the viewers that may not know this you started a curriculum at your university for teach for eternal health right so what really you know inspired you to do that and yeah what were the deciding factors for you yeah great question so go i have to go back to my master's thesis for this it was again sponsored by Olivia health and it was uh, working on one of their devices, and and just for context here, their device is meant to again treat postpartum hemorrhage, and it does so by applying vacuum to the uterus to stop the bleeding. Um, and that was my master's thesis. And as I was researching postpartum hemorrhage, I got I got so into the research. I just loved the research aspect of postpartum hemorrhage and um, kind of how the physiology of the internal reproductive organs um, are, will either work great or sometimes things go wrong. And what can we as engineers do when things go wrong during childbirth um, or just with internal reproductive organs in general? So after I defended my thesis, my thesis advisor, uh, Dr. David Clegg at Cal Poly, um, pulled me aside and suggested that I design a curriculum for a class that kind of captures this. So really the, the impetus for the class was his idea. And I never yeah. would have dreamed that that's something that I could have done as a recent graduate. And so having him kind of pushed me in that direction as he had done, you know, throughout my thesis actually was really important. Uh, so I spent a summer designing a curriculum and, and figuring out really what I wanted to include. I, I mostly facilitate students choosing a topic that they feel passionately about and can explore for 10 weeks of the quarter. Um, so that's kind of where we are with this class. We look into prevention, detection, monitoring, and treatment, where the gaps are in those major 
biomedical engineering topics, but also looking at the bigger picture. There's often gaps in education and policy um, and things like that. So we really do try to, to, before we identify ourselves as biomedical engineers, identifying ourselves as problem solvers because so many of these healthcare issues are multifaceted. And so that's that's kind of the basics of the class. I've taught this class for uh, five quarters now. We do the quarter system at Cal Poly and it's it's evolved a bit. And, and I'm so excited that students are actually taking it beyond just health around childbirth. There's a lot of uh, topics that affect people who are assigned female at birth and women things like endometriosis that affects one in 10 women, and we don't have a whole lot of research or medical solutions. So I'm excited that students are really broadening the scope of this class. Yeah, no, um, sorry, it cut out a little bit there. Um, if I didn't answer, that's probably why. But no, that's um, that's very interesting, and it's really it's really a big deal that you know you were able to do this, and you know from advice from your mentor, but just really being able to develop this curriculum and now teach, and yeah, that's awesome. Do you feel like you like you know this like academia? life is that something that you see yourself doing because you like you right now have kind of like a mixture between industry and academia correct yeah i personally i love that i'm doing both and that i can do both so staying in academia part time and working in industry part time as an engineer is just kind of honestly a dream for me um i I also try to stay impact driven. So how I think I can make the biggest impact is bringing other biomedical engineers into this space of maternal health and general health for people in female at birth. So in addition to that, also working in industry and trying to, to solve some of these big problems. Uh, I, I just, I'm, I love being part of both. It would be hard for me to take on one or the other full-time. I am just so grateful that I get to do both <laughs> part-time. Yeah, no, that's honestly awesome. And honestly, it's pretty interesting because I've actually, you know, thought before of, I've considered like academia and things like that because I do enjoy the idea of teaching and having a class um, and just being able to share knowledge and, I've actually thought in my current university or the university that I attended, one thing that I feel that was lacking was knowledge around the regulatory world of biomedical engineering, specifically like medical devices. So I, I, I used to think like, wow, it, it would be so cool to learn about regulatory, come back and then, I don't know, teach a class on regulatory. So just to see you and what you've done with this maternal health course like it's like you can actually do it and it sounds really fun and and yeah it's definitely very unique also like you mentioned that you're able to do both things and it's kind of living the best of both worlds so it sounds amazing honestly um so would you like to talk a little bit about your current experience apart from um being a lecturer i know you you're working for another medical device company, is that correct? Yeah, so I just started recently contracting with a company called DREV. Um, they're in San Francisco, and I've been following what they've been up to for mm -hmm. years. I've just been really inspired by their nonprofit model and um, efforts to design low cost solutions for low resource settings. I think that's always been kind of a passion of mine. So um, I actually met the CEO at a conference in Rwanda, and this is called the Women Leaders in Global Health Conference. And we got to chatting about mm. the maternal health field and, and the gaps in low resource settings. And, and, and so I'm on board with them to try to create a partnership so that we can get 
products to market that are going to help uh, childbirth in low resource settings. I think that's, I think we share that mission, which is just incredible to find an organization that shares that mission and be able to set up that partnership. Um, I think one thing I didn't mention was while I was working on my master's thesis, I was also pitching my own concept for a device that could hopefully uh, mm -hmm. monitor and detect severe postpartum hemorrhage. And this is something that I was taking into mm -hmm. the grant field and, and raising money for. And ultimately what it came down to for me was um, if someone else can get this to market better and faster than I can, then that is the ultimate way to to make an impact um, and really help mm. people soon and effectively. So that was something that was also an impetus for me of reaching out to this organization that absolutely shares my mission. Um, and so it's just really exciting. I, I'm very new with the company, but I, I'm I'm excited to see where it goes and hope to keep designing. <laughs> no, that sounds awesome. Um, I guess. You know, we can jump into the next section of our podcast, which is, you know, you do all these things, um, industry, academia. What inspired you to start this Instagram where you basically share, you know, about maternal health and how we can help as biomedical engineers? That's a good question. Uh, I I learn a lot from Instagram. I think Instagram is just a wonderful tool for this space, especially. There's along with the femtech, like literally technology in this um, healthcare for women and people assigned female at birth. Uh, there's a lot of advocacy that has to go along with it. There has to be advocacy to allocate funding for research and for development and for entrepreneurs and, and all of it. So the advocacy piece is so present on Instagram and I have just learned a ton. Um, so I kind of saw it as a way where students can share their research and other people can find the research and see it in a very accessible way because it seems like everyone's on Instagram for better or for worse. So um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Instagram is a huge part of that because you watch live birth on Instagram now. That hasn't always been the case. And, <laughs> and so you can really become familiar with the clinical side. As biomedical engineers, that's kind of our role is to bridge clinical with engineering. And um, a lot of us don't get to see procedures, not that birth is a procedure, but being able mm -hmm. to see what a birth is, 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 I think, is really important for what I do. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. And, you know, it's, I definitely think Instagram is a great tool um, for, you know, just sharing knowledge and educational content, but also really networking as well. And, you know, how I, I remember the first time I came across your account, it was really because I saw, I think it was a post where you put like all the companies dedicated to making solutions for maternal health and I just thought this is amazing like I've never seen all of them just like in one slide you know um, so it was really cool to see and yeah. when I just saw what you did overall it was just like this person is amazing we need to have her on a podcast so yeah it's awesome and thank you for being here and I guess it's now time to uh, just answer any questions that we, we may have from our viewers. I know we have a couple of them. I think most of them are kind of technical questions, but okay. So the first one is, did you both uh, do a VME master's in undergrad? Sarah, would you like to, I guess, just give a brief answer to that? Yeah, I did both. I'm lucky that my university offers a blended program, so I was able to do a blended undergrad and grad program. Yeah, that's that's honestly awesome. I I just have a bachelor's right now. I do want to do a master's in the future, but I really want to have, I guess, my feet in the water for a little bit longer before really deciding what I would like to focus on, I guess. 
Uh, okay, next question is, from what I've gathered so far, both of y'all seem to be in the industry sector. I like to see you compare skill sets, like who has coding skills. Okay, so I guess another way to put this question is, you know, what kind of, I guess, hard or soft skills would you say that you use mostly at your job in both industry and as a lecturer? Yeah, I, I would say that SolidWorks and, and Autodesk Fusion 360, those are the two programs that I used um, right out of school. And I used that those programs a lot in my early experience with Olydia Health. So that absolutely got my foot in the door. And then once I was already in the field, it seems like less and less I use those hard skills. Um, <laughs> it's uh, a, a lot more research on my end right now and kind of more soft skills of organizing like protocols, which, you know, are tools in themselves. So, yeah, I would say mm -hmm. as time goes on, I use less of those hard skills. Yeah, no, and that's very interesting because a lot of people here are really curious to know, like, what skills should I have and exercises of BME? And it's always very hard to answer because it's really up to what you're doing. And specifically when you're working for startups, you know, startups are always evolving and they have less employees than a big company would. So in a startup, you really have to be flexible to do different kinds of jobs evolve depending on each of that stuff. So yeah, no, it's it's really interesting. I've actually never really used any hard skills um, as an intern or as a part-time engineer right now. Um, it's always really been mostly soft skills like protocol writing or testing or really just thinking. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's really hard to put into words, but yeah, thank you for yeah. your question and your answer, Sarah. It was a great answer. Uh, so Daryl also asked, Sarah, how do you manage your time? <laughs> oh, brilliant question. Um, I <laughs> Honestly, it, it fluctuates. Sometimes I'm really happy with the way that I'm managing my time and sometimes I'm not. So, I mean, really, the thing that's helped me the mo most lately with it, I think it's extra hard to manage my time because I work from home even before COVID. So, honestly, like a lot of cafe hopping. So, I'm going to go to this cafe and work on this job. And then I'm going <laughs> to go to this cafe and work on my other jobs to at least have like a really hard transition is, is good for me. But with COVID, uh, in place of that, I have this notebook that I absolutely love. It's a habit tracking notebook, but it tools to also um, kind of prioritize to-do lists and things like that. And sometimes I literally have to write out an hour by hour schedule for myself in the day to really stay on top of yeah. what I need to do. So that's honestly, yeah, that's how I manage my time now. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, and that's really good. Uh, advice of having a you know like I've I guess I've always been very more like I don't know like I never keep up with notebooks like I always at the beginning of every semester or year I always get a new notebook that I feel like it's going to uh, just encourage me to write on it but it's always I always just lose track of notebooks like after a week like I never keep up with them like it's so bad but yeah. But no, that's well, good I'll that you're able though, to. But I'll add that I don't, I don't want to sound like I'm sponsored by this company because I'm not. But this book <laughs> that I have is from a website called Bar and Fig, B A R O N F I G, and they have this notebook that has little tools in the back. But it's and it's just a blank canvas notebook, and that has changed my product activity world for sure wow we'll definitely have to check that out uh that sounds like a great tool um okay so do you adrian want to display the next question which okay we just have a comment from andrew that he's saying that he's trying to call polly so it's awesome awesome so the next question is 
uh, what's it like being a contractor? Do companies reach out to you? Do you reach out to them? What do you do in between contracts? That's a great question. Um, so being a contractor is really interesting. I could probably talk at length about the benefits and the risks of it. There are absolutely mm -hmm. both. Um, I, I The two contracts that I've had, one of them kind of came about organically, again, kind of through my school projects. And the other one was serendipitous. I, I met the CEO mm -hmm. and she had known about my experience and I had been really fascinated with them for years. So it just really worked out. Um, I would say that if I had time, if I wasn't teaching, maybe I would reach out to companies that I was interested in and I would uh, advocate for people who are interested in certain companies to do the same. Um, showing your passion goes such a long way. So if you can just I mean, it, and it does have to be something you're passionate about. So if, the, if this company is working on something that you really care about, you can absolutely reach out to them. You don't have to go and look and see if there's a job opening or try to send in your resumes and apply through formal means. You can just work your way through talking to people and really showing how much you care. Um, and and it, it might take a lot of conversations, but uh, if they want and need somebody, uh, then you can work that out. You can work out a contract. Yeah, no, that's a great answer. And thank you for sharing that with us. Um, okay, so this is kind of a hard uh, question to answer. How can I get into a postgraduate program BME as a foreigner? Um, I'm not sure know. if I can answer that, which, you know, yeah. I'm sorry. We'll I have wish to... I could answer that, and I just don't know. You know, what I would suggest, though, is similarly, if you are passionate about something and want to reach out to a company, reach out to um, biomedical engineering departments at universities and, and see what they suggest. Yeah, I think that's definitely a good advice. And we do get a lot of people um, – that or a lot of reviewers are international and they're always asking like how can I work or study in the U.S. and it's always such a hard question to answer but yeah we're definitely getting things ready to answer that question but thank you for that advice and then the last question for today is is VME a good major graduating soon but I'm not sure what kind of place would hire a VME or what I would like to do um what's what's your opinion sarah is has been has bme been good to you yeah um bme has been great <laughs> to me i remember getting into major though and people saying and i believed this for a long time actually people would say you should have just gone into me because you can always work for a biomedical device company as an me but you're just more versatile and, and biomedical engineering companies don't know what BMEDs are, so they probably won't hire you. And, you know, like, I'm sure we've all heard the same things. Um, my personal experience is that I, I don't agree with that. I, I think biomedical engineering is relatively new, but more and more companies are really starting to understand what biomedical engineering is. Um, and I think that what helped me is I found something that I cared about while I was in school and focusing mm -hmm. all of my projects on this topic and on this field, I think really helped me after I graduated. And so maybe that would just be my advice is, is like get involved in clubs and see what field within biomedical engineering really stands out to you because that'll kind of help you go down that path. And as a biomedical engineer, I'm, my life might evolve and I might not always be an engineer. I think the more and more I understand about healthcare, the more I'm interested in public health and global health. And we have a you know, master's of public health degrees and PHs. Uh, and that's always an option as well that I think we don't always think about when we think of healthcare and biomedical engineering merging. Yeah, no, 
That's a great answer. And, you know, it's funny that this question was brought up because today I actually uh, came up as this podcast that basically said, don't major in biomedical engineering. And I, sh- I thought of sharing it just to, like on Instagram. And I was like, should I share it? Should I not? I don't want to discourage anyone. But I think it's good to be aware of this opinion that we know a lot of people, not a lot of people, but some people actually have this opinion that BME is not a good major. And it can be very discouraging to a lot of people, you know, especially if you're a young student trying to decide what major to do. And yeah, I really just wanted to put it out there to for people to be aware that there are people that don't really believe in the major. But to be honest, most of these people don't even know anything about biomedical engineering. So I don't even know if it's valid. But yeah, no, I think I think it's great to like, you know, every time I talk to someone with a BME degree, like they always love what they do. And I think it's just great to show people that it is a great major. And like, if you find, yeah, like something that a focus that you're truly passionate about, it's even better. And the thing is that, yeah, like you said, you you don't really have to stick to the engineering. You know, there are so many other things that you could also do. But if you do decide to just be more of an engineer, then that's also a thing. Like, there's just so much you can do with it. But yeah, so short answer, BME is good. But I mean, obviously, it also depends on everyone's individual interests. And I guess just one very, very last question is, I don't know much about BME, but do you prefer dogs or cats? (laughs) What's your answer, Sarah? (laughs) I have to say I am a cat person. I'm actually (laughs) cat sitting as we speak, and I'm totally expecting her to come walking through the door right now, but she's MIA at the moment. Oh, that's so cute. What's what's her name or their name? I'm not sure. Her name is Lupin. Oh, that's so cute. I actually, you know, I'm also a cat person, um, but it's interesting. And this is so interesting that this question actually came up because I was thinking about this today. Because when I get asked this question, do you like dogs or cats better? I've always answered cats, even though I do like dogs too. But I always answer cats because I know there's this like uh, opinion behind cats that a lot of people actually don't like cats. And like, they're like, why would you like cats? Like they're grumpy or whatever. And like, so every time someone asks me which one I like better, I always say cats because I just wanna be an advocate for cats. You know, like I want people to know that cats cats can be nice and sweet and they they can be amazing pets. So today that I came across this BME uh, opinion of of it not being a good major, I thought, you know, I feel like it's almost like how I answer (laughs) that cats are good because let's kind of, like the same thing like I I'm just trying to advocate for this major and tell people that it is good don't listen to people yeah. that don't like cats they're awesome cats and <laughs> so BMEs basically are the underdog me. no pun intended yeah <laughs> yeah that's perfect okay so there's your answer uh BMEs like cats so okay so I think you know we're coming to the end of this podcast and we've covered everything uh, that we wanted to cover. So Sarah, before we say bye to our viewers, is there anything that um, you would like to share, any final advice or maybe maybe something you would like to bring awareness? Oops, I hope that you're still there. I think you cut out for a second there. Um, I heard the first part of your question. Hi. If I have any um, last notes or, or advice, yes, yeah, so and I would just say like... that I still cutting out. So I'll answer what I heard. Uh, so I would say that um, biomedical engineering, like Mary was saying, is just a really wonderful major because 
before we're engineers, we're problem solvers, and that's just going to help us no matter what we do in life. I I know that it's helped me in all kinds of strange things I've done. I'm uh, chair of an events committee, and it, being a biomedical engineer, oddly enough, has, has helped me with that. So be focusing my career around problem solving and, and really problem solving for the things that I care about is totally all it's about. So um, I would say that that's what I've got. Uh, I mean, there are specific topics in this women's health field or uh, healthcare for people assigned female at birth. And uh, I do think that this field is totally up and coming and it is something that VMEDS can get into and involved with and, and a field that we need engineers for as problem solvers. So that's what I have to say. Um, I'm sure I wish we could, you know, have a, more time because I could talk about this for hours. <laughs> no, yeah, that's, that's awesome. And those are really great points. And yeah, so I think, you know, we've reached the end of this podcast. Um, thank you, Sarah, so much for being here. If our viewers would like to learn more about Sarah and what she does and all the knowledge that she shares, make sure to follow her at Engineering Maternal Health on Instagram. And yeah, so I think this is where we say bye to our viewers. And thank you, Sarah, for being here. Thanks so much, Mary.